Joining me now is Nathan Thrall. He is a Jewish American journalist based in Jerusalem, and he is author of the new book, A Day in the Life of Abed Salama. Nathan, thank you for being here. Um, I, I've been reading some of the interviews you've been doing, and I, I'm so interested in your perspective on sort of the root of this as it concerns Hamas. Because on a certain level, one would assume Hamas would know that executing such a brutal, historically brutal attack on Israel would lead to a devastating response, a full throttle response from uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. I wonder what you think the strategy is behind this and whether uh, Hamas believes that in fact a ground invasion was ultimately going to happen. I think that um, Hamas was surprised uh, by the uh, degree to which it um, uh, succeeded in carrying out the attack. Um, it, um, I think, was quite shocked at the speed with which it took over Israeli military bases and uh, communities, and um, and the number of uh, captives that it got, I think, also exceeded all its expectations. Um, that said, the, the uh, nature of the attack that it planned uh, is, is unprecedented, and they had to know that Israel would respond in a way that it never uh, has contemplated doing before. And uh, what we're about to see probably as soon as the next few hours is, is that uh, Israeli response that we've never seen before, uh, which is going to be a very bloody and very costly ground invasion. And we've already seen Israel has called on uh, over a million people to move from northern Gaza to southern Gaza. They're um, cutting off food, electricity, and water to 2.1 million people who have absolutely nothing to do with the uh, Hamas attack. And they probably intend to reoccupy uh, parts of Gaza. And I think that Hamas absolutely planned for that to happen. They are planning to attack uh, Israel from uh, tunnels within Gaza. They're planning to abduct more Israeli soldiers that come into Gaza. And, um, you know, Hamas is not an, uh, a state army. It does not pose an existential threat to Israel. Uh, the Israeli army does pose an existential threat to Hamas. And um, Hamas has put at risk its territorial control of Gaza. And it may see that as a worthwhile risk if it stands to gain leadership of the Palestinian national movement and perhaps to eventually uh, come to power uh, over all the Palestinian uh, national movement and, and lead the PLO. But, um, but it's uh, a tremendous uh, risk and the people of Gaza are uh, now paying the price. Yeah, the, the idea that Hamas may try and use this to effectively seize control from Fatah, a more secular organization, seems to be the only, I mean, th that seems to be, if you look for a reason as to why they would try and do this, that would seem to be it. I do wonder if you think, if that is the case, whether, as The Atlantic writes, as The Atlantic uh, has a piece today called Israel is walking into a trap, whether, in fact, you know, Hamas is counting on Israel to attack Gaza with such ferocity that the international sympathy of the past week toward Israel, even in the Arab world, evaporates quickly and is replaced by outrage at the suffering inflicted on the two million residents of Gaza. I mean, is that sort of the inevitable path that we are heading down? Uh, absolutely. I mean, um, I don't think any uh, person can um, look at the images that we are already seeing from Gaza. I have a very close and dear colleague and friend uh, who lives there, who had shrapnel in his living room, who was separated from his daughter, couldn't find her. Um, he's now relocated in a, in a someone else's home with dozens of other uh, people uh, in southern Gaza. Um, anyone who looks at these images, the, the level of destruction, the raising of the most prosperous upscale area of Gaza City, Rimal, um, 
no one is going to look at the, the killing of, of people fleeing um, uh, the northern Gaza to the south and not feel tremendous sympathy for uh, for them, for these innocent civilians. And of course, that's going to change uh, public opinion throughout the world. And then eventually we're going to see more forceful calls for a ceasefire. At right now, we don't even have the U.S. calling for a ceasefire. We don't even have the U.S. Uh, stopping Israel from collectively punishing 2.1 million innocent people by cutting off food, water, and electricity to them. Um, it, it, the U.S. is complicit in a war crime right now. Uh, in the meantime, uh, it looks like that kind of the, the after effects of this ground invasion and certainly the bombing campaign may ultimately scuttle the normalization agreements that the U.S. was helping broker between Israel and Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia, which is exactly what a country like Iran would like to see happen. And Iran, though it is inconclusive, may have been involved in planning this attack in the first place. There is a lot to untangle in all of this. Nathan Thrall, I really appreciate your time and expertise in trying to help us understand what's happening here. Thanks again. Thank you for having me.